So this recording is going to focus on understanding the language sample analysis that you get um, when you utilize SALT specifically. Um, and so typically that's going to be through the SALAD lab at WVU, um, although SALT is available for um, school districts and professionals to purchase as well. So we just want to provide some information on that. Uh, specifically, uh, we want you to understand the language sample transcription, and so some of the sample is going to look different than just a typical writing out of what you hear. And so we want to go over some of those, what we refer to as conventions, so that you'll understand what you're getting. Um, we also want to talk about some common analyses that are done for academic language. Um, some of this may not make as much sense, but we will be providing a training on some aspects of academic language and what that looks like and um, some common phrases in the literature related to language development in these more advanced stages. Um, and then we also want to provide you an opportunity to practice looking at all of these and interpreting them and um, identifying possible uh, behaviors to target related to the West Virginia College and Career Readiness Standards. So um, in disclosure, all of the information today is going to be related to SALT um, and those transcripts. Um, additionally, uh, I do need to disclose that I am getting paid um, to do this presentation uh, and also that um, there is no, I have no um, financial or non-financial ties to SALT though, so um, I don't necessarily have any of those disclosures. So utilization of transcription services. We thought it would be nice to provide you some feedback on how much you guys have been utilizing the services. Um, initially, when we first started in 2017, it was a pretty slow start, but that's to be expected. So um, I get really excited when I see how much it increased over 2018 and 19, um, because we went from 15 to 60, which is like a 400% increase. So if we keep that um, pace up, it's going to be amazing. Um, uh, this year, uh, these were data from October 2019, so um, we know for sure that this number is already increased in December because we've had a couple of really big weeks um, in November where we had a lot of requests. So um, this is just great testament to all of you and your use of this resource, um, and so we want to thank you for that. Um, related to the types of samples all of you have been requesting from us, um, you know, initially it's not unexpected that we were focusing on conversation, um, but because of Leanne's um, dedication to ongoing professional development, you can see that we've transitioned to more um, requests for narrative transcription. And so that's a great testament again to you guys and um, your integration of all of the information that you're getting about best practice and what we need to be doing with our school age students. Um, related to who's using our services, you can also see based on the data um, that we're starting to get a large variety of different SLPs um, using the different um, resources. And so again, I just, it's really important to us that we're helping to facilitate you in doing your job and making things a little more manageable. Um, we know that your workloads are amazingly high. So this is just one way um, that to be honest, uh, the state and the university can partner to help and um, I get excited because I think it's a great experience for the graduate students and undergraduate students um, to get experience with samples from kids with language disorders who are actually on your um, caseloads so that they can see these real life examples. So it's just kind of a win-win for all of us, I hope. 
Our goal is to continue increasing. So we would love to have a 400% increase again this year. So I encourage you, if you haven't had an opportunity to get on the website and see what is available to you, please go ahead and do that. Um, I jokingly have this picture because we would love for our current grad student, Allie, um, to be as overwhelmed as she was one week and it was either late October early November where we had 20 requests all in one week and so you know if that's the kind of pace that we maintain we would definitely need to seek some assistance from the state so that we could get some more help for um, Allie but you know at this time we're just really excited that it's getting used more and more so again thank you. And now um, I'm going to really focus on kind of what you're going to get, because I know those of you that have um, gotten the information, you get so much data when we send it to you. And, and uh, while that's a good thing, it can be overwhelming um, to get that much information. And so um, we give you all of the analyses that we can do with SALT. Um, and so there's some pretty standard things. And then um, depending on what you ask for, and we're gonna be making changes to the website after this presentation um, so that you guys can be more specific now about the types of information that you would like to do and the reports that you would like to have done um, so that we can better fit your needs on what you're needing with that particular client. Um, so big picture, I um, have over here on the right side a picture of a transcript um, as it would appear in SALT when you see it. And you can see that each line has its own line. So when we talk about a T unit, um, that is going to be each of these particular lines that you see here. Um, each T unit is um, what a lay person would refer to as a sentence, meaning that it has um, a subject and a predicate. And we'll talk about that more in a minute, but depending on the sample you request, um, some samples are segmented and analyzed according to what we call T units. Others are segmented based on C units. Um, C units are for conversation, and so if you request a conversational sample, it's going to utilize an analysis that is C units. C units do not require a subject and a predicate because when we're in conversation, it's okay for me to say, what would you like for lunch? A hamburger and some chips. Um, and that would be considered an appropriate response um, and perfectly grammatical and whatnot. Um, so you don't have to respond to that question in a full sentence. Uh, when I do a narrative, though, the expectation is that the entire narrative would include full sentences. And so therefore, because that's the expectation for that particular genre, um, we segment and analyze according to T units. And if a phrase or a single word were done, um, we would actually exclude that from the analysis. So that's something to consider um, when you go to think about and read through the transcripts that you're looking at. Um, the other thing that we don't necessarily have an example of, but just so you know with dialogue, um, typically, you would only have one line of the dialogue stay with a T unit. So if um, a student said, uh, the alien said, I want you to come back to the spacecraft, um, you're going to share about Earth when we get back to my um, planet. Um, the first part of that would be included in a single T unit, but the next sentence or T unit would be what the person was going to do when they got down there, that you were going to um, share information about Earth on his planet. So um, it's important to understand that we try not to basically inflate um, the MLU uh, and some other measures by keeping all of that dialogue on the same line because that would create an extremely long sentence and might really skew the information. The other thing that you're going to notice on this particular sample is that we have these parentheses here um, and those are what we refer to as mazes uh, and what they do is because the parentheses are around those words 
um, it omits it from the analysis. So when it goes to calculate MLU, this word these does not get included in this entire line's number of morphemes. Um, the same with this and, we have what would be referred to as a habitual starter here with this student where they're starting um, every line with and. And so we start um, putting that in parentheses so that we don't, again, inflate that MLU with this habitual sentence starter that's actually a pretty low level um, linguistic skill at this point for a child of this age. Um, Again, I mentioned that we exclude this to try and make sure that our numbers aren't inflated or deflated. Uh, the other thing to understand, because when we go to look at our analysis, there are some children with language disorders that are characterized by what I think of as organizational or word finding problems. And usually those two go hand in hand. Um, and so when I see a a student who has a lot of mazing in their sample, this tells me that they're um, possibly having trouble finding the right word. So they might be doing what we call a circumlocution, um, where they're talking around the word, describing the word, so, because they can't find the right word to use. Um, they also may be having a hard time thinking of what they want to say, and so they maintain um, their uh, turn by having these fillers like, I'm not sure what to say next, um, that would be a filler. Uh, these types of things demonstrate an, a difficulty with getting your, your thoughts, and, um, your words out, and that type of thing. Um, and so while they are disfluencies, they rest within a language disorder in reality. And so amazing can be very telling with our students. And we'll look at some measures here pretty soon that provide um, data that you could utilize when um, measuring your students' progress and improving their ability to decrease um, the amount of their sample that is mazed. Um, the next thing we have are these asterisks that occur right before words. So here we have one before and. Um, I don't know if there's any others in this particular sample. When you see that, what that means is the and was actually not said. So in reality, what the child said was, and then we saw alien craft. Um, and oh, here is another one. So we ran home, told our mom. And so the and was not said. And so we do that to note that. And then there's an analysis again that we can run that looks for whether or not there's a pattern in the types of words that are getting omitted in these types of errors. We also have an asterisk up here after this F and after this P. What that indicates is the child started to say a sound or part of a, a word and then changed their mind. Again, if you go back to what I was talking about with these mazes, you can see that this would be a similar type of error as using the wrong word or having a filler or you know these word finding types of problems. So one day me and my friend Utley Wentz um, went, we're going to the park. Um, so again, he said this word, but it really isn't part of the final sentence, and so therefore we maze it. Um, so these are things to think about because as you look at this, I would encourage you to read the sample out loud, or if you still have the audio recording, to go back and listen to the audio recording while you're reading the transcript that we send to you because it will help it make more sense. Um, it's one of the things that I try to tell students when I'm training them they should always do first um, is listen to it the whole way through. So now you're also going to notice that we have these what I call backslashes all over the sample. Um, and then remembering that SALT is a computer program, you have to understand that these backslashes are used to denote another morpheme in that particular word. And we only do this for grammatical morphemes. So our derivational morphemes do not get slashed, only our grammatical morphemes like um, the progressive tense for ing. We have a plural s on bushes. 
So you'll notice this is not orthographically spelled correctly, um, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Uh, you also have it on suitcases. Um, you have it on regular past tense, ED. Um, and then you would also have it on a possessive tense. We don't have any examples of those, but like Jane's dog or the alien's dog would be a slash Z, which is down here. Um, so all of these, for each one that happens, SALT then knows to calculate saying as two morphemes as opposed to say, which is one morpheme. So one of the things that I mentioned is that you'll notice that, and with these, it's not as good of an example, but you'll notice, oh, here, having. Have is still spelled the way it would be if it wasn't having. And we do that because when we're doing our word counts, um, SALT doesn't know the that have, H-A-V-E, and H-A-V in having are actually the same root word. And so that SALT knows this when it goes to do a number of different word count, we have to keep that root word that's on the left side of the slash spelled correctly. And so you're going to see that it's not an error in the student spelling. It's so that SALT then knows not to inflate that number. And you're going to see that in one of the first analyses that we look at. Um, related to that, when SALT is doing word counts, you'll also notice that things like proper names, like Utley Wentz, if it was Morgantown, West Virginia, um, or it was, um, let's say, the name of a movie like The Princess Bride, all of those would have an underscore in between each of those words so that SALT would count them as a single morpheme. It's standard practice in a in language sample analysis that we not count these as multiple separate words because the student is treating it as a name. So like Mrs. Smith, um, Jane Doe, all of those would have an underscore and be counted as a single morpheme. Um, my example, the Princess Bride, even though that's three words, it would be a single morpheme. So again, these are things to just try and help it make a little more sense so that you know. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about why derivational morphemes aren't counted um, when we calculate MLU, but we'll spend a lot more time talking about that in a future presentation that I'll be doing on later language development. Um, but one of the reasons why we do not count derivational morphemes like the ly or the re and renew, um, ly and really, um, dis and disagree, all of those um, predicates um, and, and whatnot that we add to words to either change their meaning or change a verb into an adverb, um, so changing its syntactic class. That's one of the ways that students increase their vocabulary in um, the school age years and actually through adulthood. And so if we were to slash those, we would lose the ability to see if their number of different words was growing with their age. And so um, in order to better examine their semantic system and their semantic growth, we don't actually slash the derivational morphemes um, when we analyze language samples. So that's just something to be aware of if you're thinking like on this apparently that we should have slashed that. Um, that's actually a um, derivational morpheme, and so we wouldn't. Um, so hopefully this helps to have the actual transcript make a little more sense. Um, I'll try and read through this just so that you can get a feeling for what it would sound like in reality. Um, so starting at the top, one day me and my friend Utley Wentz went, were going to the park, and then we saw alien craft and we hid behind the bushes. And there's these, a mom and a little kid with a weird looking dog and their dad with suitcases. And this, and there was another, it looked like their uncle or someone. And they were saying, he was saying bye. And apparently the mom and dad and the little kid and the dog were having the picnic. And then, and then, 
So we ran home, told our mom. We ran back and then they were gone. Then the examiner, that's what the ease is, says, anything about your story? And we have this, what I call a time mark. And you can see it takes four seconds for the child to respond. And he says, and then, and then we never saw them again. Um, that time mark, again, when we think about those children that I was mentioning earlier that have organizational word finding types of problems, maybe processing problems like auditory comprehension is poor, um, you may see more of these lapses in their sample where they're pausing um, either mid-sentence or between sentences. And so we add these time marks because, again, um, in some of our analyses, this can be really important in demonstrating that this student is having some short-term memory issues, maybe some word-finding problems. Um, so when we're looking for measures that best match the characteristics of their language disorder, those can be things that um, highlight that. You'll also see that at the bottom we have this minus one minute, 23 seconds. That is the length of time it took for the students to tell this sample. Um, and so again, this is a great way um, for some of our students who have organizational problems or when our students are not giving us as much information as their peers would, so their stories are shorter or their near expositories are not um, as long as their peers, um, the amount of time can be something that demonstrates this um, difference between them and what their peers are doing. So the next step that we're gonna talk about is our analysis options. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to share with you is, you know, I know for some of you, um, you're perfectly happy having us analyze and send you the results. Um, but for those that may be interested, you do have the option of doing um, the SALT training modules that they have, and they're available online. Um, you can do them for free at no cost if you don't want CEUs. If you do want CEUs, um, you would uh, need to pay an annual fee. And so I'm going to show you what that would look like. So here are all of the different training modules. Um, again, you'll see that the cost is that they're free um, and that you can pay for them if you would like um, in order to get credit for them. So like, um, Introduction to Language Sample Analysis. Uh, you're going to need to sign in and create your own account to do this because even though you can see this is no cost because I'm not going to take it for credit, um, I have to add it to my cart and then when I, I check out and I don't have to even put in credit card information, um, but I can then access um, things in my account that I've downloaded. Um, and, and included that I would like to train. So these are ways that if you're wanting to look for more information or if some things that I'm telling you, you want to get some of that information. So things that you should think about when you're picking the task, and I know we've talked about this before, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, but um, things to consider when you're picking your analysis is the type of task that you've selected and you'll definitely see this when we start to look at some of the scoring related to organization and structure um, you're going to do a different type of analysis if it's narrative versus expository versus persuasive so that would definitely be something to consider when you're thinking about what data do i want um, I always like to go back to what the family is telling you in regards to their concerns and the teacher. Um, one of the first things that I like to do when I'm meeting with students, clients, families to try and identify where they want to start is obviously I talk to them about what I'm seeing. Um, they've shared with me what they're seeing. Um, but I, I like to just open with the question of if there was one thing that you feel like is a barrier to their ability to 
to do what they need to do related to language? What do you think that one barrier is? And I think that's an important question to start with because I hear what their concerns are and I hear um, where they feel like the language disorder is really standing in the way of the client being able to do what they need to do. Um, I can then take that information with my knowledge um, and figure out, okay, this is the behavior that's causing that barrier. And so I'm going to address that first, and this is how I'm going to do that. Um, so it, it really helps to frame that conversation. It makes them an active member of the conversation. It's also something that in all reality, that's a much simpler question to answer as a parent or a teacher than, you know, do you think we should work on MLU or macro structure of narratives or um, that's that's that automatically puts a, a line between us and them because I'm utilizing terminology or words, even receptive and expressive language are not words that you hear a typical person using. And so I try to make sure that when I'm having those conversations about what to work on and whatnot, that I keep that at the level of my audience. And so um, obviously, as families have been working with us for a longer period of time, their knowledge, their vocabulary, their um, ability to engage in more um, specific just, uh, information may evolve to where um, I know I've worked with families that have kids with really severe disabilities. Sometimes I think they know more about um, the disorder and terminology than I do um, because the internet has really allowed them to self-educate at a level that can be good, um, but it can also challenge us as the professional as well for good and bad. Um, I also like to think about, you know, what are the measures that relate to academic language? And so we're going to try and spend a little bit of time thinking about, okay, when I'm looking at MLU, how would a teacher, how would a parent um, describe problems with MLU um, so that I can start making that bridge between the way they talk and the way I'm going to analyze and measure progress. How can I get those two things to overlap so that um, we can actually be working on the same thing and be supporting one another? Um, and then again, ideally, um, I always like for my base, my data that I've gathered in my evaluation, whether it's a narrative, whether it's a conversational sample, um, it is always my goal that that can serve as my baseline data for my goal. Um, I, in trying to be as efficient as possible, um, I always try to, especially during a first um, time with a student, so the student's just gone through the full evaluation and determined that they qualify for services. Um, in an ideal world, the activities that I've done within that evaluation process um, will provide the baseline data that I need for the goal, and then I will just um, redo those types of activities periodically over that first year in the IEP to measure progress, but I'm able to then hit that first treatment session running um, and not having to do some kind of a baseline data activity. So one of the other things that I really want to make sure um, that I present up front because it's going to be the way that I think about analysis, um, the way that I talk about the analysis, is that I, I try to go back to that underlying theory that we were all trained on related to form, content, and use. Um, and so that I ensure that um, we're all on the same page, um, please remember that form includes phonology, morphology, and syntax. Um, I kind of call these, you know, the skeleton of language. Um, if you think about phonology as being the underpinnings that go into our vocabulary, morphology is kind of how do we make sentences grammatical, and then um, we also have ways to change words and sentences. So it's kind of this little tool that we can use to transform the things around us. And then we have syntax, which relates to, you know, what's the order everything's supposed to go to go in in a sentence. When we think about content, um, these are our words. 
pure and simple. Um, but we do have overlap, right? Because we talked about how derivational morphology increases our vocabulary. And so this little section here where we were, we have the overlap in that Venn diagram is, is a great illustration of where derivational morphology and, and form and content overlap. Um, and one impacts the other. And so deficits in vocabulary are likely to create deficits in derivational morphology, which then creates impact on morphology. Um, when we talk about use, um, pragmatics is so much more than eye contact and turn taking. And I spend so much time trying to explain to students that um, the complexity of use cannot be underestimated and its development in the school age years and importance when we think about reading comprehension, um, the ability to do presentations, to interpret information accurately, both um, what's presented orally as well as in reading and writing. Um, it's just so critical because the nuances change everything. Um, so when we talk about use, um, we're talking about the rules of what should a narrative have in it. You know, what's the order things should go in? What do I include? What do I not include? Um, obviously, having a strong understanding of that improves your reading comprehension, um, as well as your ability to then write stories. Uh, what do I do differently when I'm doing an expository writing task that's a compare contrast versus descriptive? And understanding how that also then changes your vocabulary you use because um, a compare contrast is going to use transition words like similarly in contrast um, difference uh, so again all of that is actually wrapped into use and that doesn't even account for words that have double meanings um, how if I say a word differently it can drastically change the meaning of the sentence I like that dress I like that dress um, you know and your facial expressions can really impact in reality, you don't like that dress. You think it's the ugliest thing that you've ever seen versus, wow, that is one of the most beautiful dresses I've ever seen. And it's the exact same sentence with the exact same words. And the only thing that I've changed is my tone and intonation. And these are things that kids with language disorders really struggle with um, and are critically important as we get in the third grade through 12th grade years um, that we have to train them to pay attention to these things. Um, to start tuning in to what others would think of as not a big deal. So all of this as I go forward and we look at these analysis sheets together um, are going to relate back to this form content use discussion. So we have some basic reports that we're going to look at here in a minute, um, but I'm going to kind of go through and talk about what these different reports are, um, and then we'll look at them. I'm not sure if this is um, the best order of things. It's, it's one of those big debates uh, of which thing to put first. Let's look at some samples. Let's go through what these different reports are. But um, the first report is kind of the basics. It's what we call the standard measures report, and it's going to give you your very basic information um, related to intelligibility, um, related to your percent utterances that have some kind of grammatical error, um, whether that's a word omission, uh, they overused regular past tense ED, um, they omitted their auxiliary or copula verb, um, it's going to have things like the MLU, so that mean length of utterance in words or morphemes. It's going to have things related to semantics, like your total number of words in the sample, your number of different words in the sample. Um, you're also going to have measures of the transcript length. Um, so how many total T units did it have or C units? Um, we can do, oops, sorry. We can do measures for the narrative scoring schemes to look at the macrostructure elements. Um, there's also measures related to expository and persuasive. Um, and then we have measures of verbal facility and what that entails. We also have an analysis called word lists, bound morphemes, and utterance distribution. Um, and so really, this gives you more detailed information related to semantics and morphosyntax. 
um, you'll see that there's nothing in the analysis that relates to pragmatics or use. Um, with content, you're going to get lists of different types of words that they've used as far as syntactic class. Um, and that type of thing. So it might help you identify whether there's common words or word classes, like they don't have a lot of verbs, they're not, they're using the same nouns over and over again, they're using a lot of indefinite nouns, this, that thing, um, those types of words. Um, you can get a lot of information about grammatical morphology, like your bound morphemes. So if this is one of your kindergartners who's still omitting their third person singular S and their regular past tense ED, this might be an analysis that would be useful for them. Um, and then you also can see how much variation they have in their utterance length. Um, and we'll talk about that more in detail. So are they primarily using five morpheme utterances, six morpheme utterances, and it just literally gives you a, a tally count of how many based on the number of morphemes um, on that and what that looks like. We also have a sheet that's called the maze summary. Um, this would be something to consider for those students that appear to have some short-term memory, word organization. Um, maybe people are saying they're disfluent. Um, one of the things that we have to figure out with our students that are classified as disfluent is whether or not they're exhibiting stuttering or language issues. Um, stuttering issues are going to be primarily at the word level because they're going to entail blocks, prolongations, um, repetitions, sound repetitions. Um, the minute they start getting into whole word repetitions, circumlocutions, pauses, fillers, those are all language-based types of um, disfluencies. And so those get treated in a very different way as compared to those fluency um, stuttering types of disfluencies. Um, and then we have what are referred to as our clutterers who are disfluent because really they they need to have a rapid rate of speech. And that's going to be something that um, distinguishes the clutterers from uh, the word finding organizational students um, because they're not necessarily going to have a fast rate of speech. They're going to have pauses. They're going to have um, possibly a longer sample, but not because they have more words or, or more T units, but it's really because it's taking them longer to get their thoughts and ideas out. Um, I just had an SLP this week um, send me a description where the student would literally close their eyes to try and think of what they were doing, and she asked her, you know, are are you having a hard time getting the word out or are you trying to think of what you're trying to say? And the student said, you know, I just can't think of the word that I'm trying to say. And so those are kids that with language disorders that we're talking about. And this is an analysis that would be very interesting to look at to help identify those patterns um, because we can look at the types of mazed words they have, how frequency uh, how frequent they're having those, um, how frequently within an utterance they're having them, what types are they having, and then an analysis of the types of pauses. Are they in sentence, between sentences, all over the place, that type of thing. Another analysis that we can do related to discourse summary. So this is going to be primarily pragmatics in nature um, and focus more on that. Um, so this is those ones looking at different genres and your ability to organize that genre um, and include the information that you would want. And we're going to look at these rubrics uh, here in a minute for those particular different contexts like a narrative scoring scheme, an expository scoring scheme, and a persuasive scoring scheme. And these are the ones that are present in SALT. Um, and so there's data in the database if you use those prompts where you can make comparisons. Another analysis that we can do, again, this is going to be for those students that are struggling with their grammatical morphology. So um, it should primarily be your five, six, seven year olds that are getting this particular sheet. You know, your middle school, high school kids. Um, for the most part, we'll probably have grammatical sentences. Their um, errors are typically looking a little bit different, um, but this would provide specific information 
on those um, morphology, those form measures like plural S, possessive S, regular past tense ED, the progressive verb tense, third person singular S, like in jumps, um, those types of things. The last thing that we have is what's called an omissions and error codes. This can be really helpful along with that bound morpheme table for those kids that are still having grammatical errors because those omissions are sometimes our auxiliaries and copulas. They can be our articles like R and AN. Um, but then with our error codes, we have an error word code that's EW that we put right beside words. So those kids with pronoun errors, um, if he's using him for he, um, by the him, we would put an EW in brackets to note that. And this would be the analysis that would pull all of those out so that you could look at them for patterns of errors. Um, so all of this is going to be um, options when we go to look at it. Um, there are other specific ones with what we call the subordination index analysis that we can code for and then analyze that gives you your clausal density so that it's a measure again of form because it looks at complex syntax. Are they using dependent clauses? Um, what types of dependent clauses are they using? Um, so these are the analyses that we can do um, going forward and that you have available to you. So now we're going to look more specifically at when we use SALT, um, what those analysis that I talked about with the narrative scoring scheme, the expository scoring scheme, and the persuasive scoring scheme, you know, what exactly are those rubrics and what do they look like? So the narrative scoring scheme is this five point scale um, that looks at these different parts of a narrative um, and we rate them. And obviously, um, when we go to rate them, um, we see evolution as students get older and, and in higher grades, they're moving more to the proficient level and away from the immature. And then depending on which of these characteristics we're looking at here, whether it's introduction or character development, So when we look at the narrative scoring scheme, you'll see, again, as I mentioned, it's a five point scale. Um, two and four are not defined in this particular rubric, um, and, but they do provide um, expectations of what would be for a one, a three, or a five in each of these areas. Um, we talk about, you know, the development of their introduction, the development of their characters, um, whether or not they have mental and emotional states for their characters. Um, so those are those uh, reactions to what's happening. Um, how well they do referencing and, and pay attention to their listeners so that they make sure that um, the right pronouns and antecedents are used so that the clarity of the story. All of us have listened to the student with a language disorder who starts telling us a story and um, there may be three male characters and at some points we don't know who's doing what because they're all he and his and him. Um, the same thing with their resolution and conflict, you know, how well do they identify um, the initiating event in their story, um, have actions afterwards, and then wrap that up. Um, the ties between activities, um, between sentences is going to include your cohesion, and then how well they wrap up or conclude their story um, beyond a the end type of thing. So this is a five point rubric. They get an overall score for the entire thing. And then using this rubric, there's been um, a database. So if you have kids that don't have well-developed stories, this is a measure that can look at that macro structure level of analysis. Um, similarly, we have the expository scoring scheme. Again, um, this is going to be a five-point scale. You can see you have your one, your three, or your five. Um, and this is specific to that favorite game or sport task. Um, that's available in SALT. So um, you're not going to use this with a different task that you make up. 
it really is specific to that favorite game or sport task when we look at this particular rubric and rating the different activity or components of what that should look like in that um, activity that we have students do, um, whether that's clearly identifying what it is that they're going to be describing, um, providing basic information about the um, activity, you know, where it should be done, the playing area, the types of things you need in order to do it. So is it, if it's a game, do you need a game board? Do you need pieces? Do you need dice? Um, if it's a sporting game, do they talk about uniforms and whether or not you have hoops and balls, um, those types of things? Um, do they provide a beginning point for how the game is supposed to start? So in football, you would need to describe that kickoff. Um, in basketball, you've got the tip off. Um, at the beginning of a lot of games, you know, everybody rolls to see who goes first. So those are the types of things that are going to get rated when the students go to complete the expository task related to the um, favorite game or sport. Um, so again, a student that's having organizational issues in the classroom, completing their writing assignments, um, the teacher says, that their information is disorganized when they do presentations. Um, they have a hard time breaking down a task that's given to them. So they're given a writing assignment that, and they don't know where to start. Um, these are the types of students that might need this kind of an expository scoring scheme completed. The next one we have is what's referred to as the persuasive scoring scheme. Again, this looks at the structure of the um, persuasive task that they do um, related on that um, SALT database. So again, this is specific to that particular task and couldn't be extended to a different task at this point in time. Um, but this would be something that looks at whether or not they've clearly identified the issue or the change that's needed. Um, so I think I need a later bedtime and this is why, the reasons why they think that. Do they provide other people's points of view? So do they provide a parent's perspective and then um, provide a counter argument or do they dismiss it? Or do they not even really acknowledge that somebody might see this issue from a different perspective? Um, so again, these are the types of things that get rated on that one, three, five scale um, that we've used before. So now we're going to spend some time really digging in and looking at some different um, analyses for some clients that have been submitted um, this fall uh, to the database. So we got permission. Um, I thought it would be helpful to see some actual students um, analysis transcripts and the types of analysis that were provided to them at the same time. Before we kind of dig into that, one of the things that I, I you will notice when I'm going to be talking about the samples and what um, I see as patterns is uh, when we go to talk about language and treating language, we want to focus on identifying or treating patterns of errors. So um, I always go back to phonology and phonological processes because for whatever reason that makes sense to everybody that um, we're not going to treat each phoneme in the final consonant position when a child is doing final consonant deletion, but rather we treat that linguistic pattern of final consonants and that final consonants are important. And so therefore we need to include final consonants in our words. Um, and we don't, again, specifically identify which sounds we're going to do in the final consonant position, we do them all. Um, the reason why that's important is another prime example is our grammatical morphology. Um, when we talk about verb tense agreement, so those endings we put on verbs so that they're grammatical, like the S on jumps, um, the ED on jumped, um, or the auxiliary verb and the ING when we're doing present progressive. So he is jumping. Um, all of those are verb tense agreement. And so when a child is struggling with those, we should be treating that pattern of error and not the specific ones. 
Um, so the goal itself, the behavior that we're targeting is verb tense agreement. Um, now, the way that we go about doing that may be cyclical in nature, much like phonological processes, because today I'm going to focus on regular past tense ED, the next day I'm going to do third person singular S, and so on and so forth. Um, but in reality, um, we're not going to do a goal that focuses on regular past tense ED or a goal. So we need to, the purpose of our language sample analysis is to try and identify these patterns, and that's why I bring this up now. So we're not, much like we don't write goals based on items on standardized tests in our language sample analysis, we don't write goals based on specific things, we base them on, on patterns that we're seeing in what they're doing. I also want to emphasize that it's really important to utilize other sources of information. So while today I'm focusing on the language samples and we're kind of talking like this is the only piece of information when we're trying to identify what to target, um, please know that in practice I would want to be listening to the information from the teachers, um, from the parents, the standardized test information, as well as the language sample stuff. So um, I'm not telling you to disregard everything else and only utilize your language sample. It's just for the purposes of this training, it's much easier um, to kind of keep things confined into that. Um, so I just, I want to say that on the outset, please know that um, I'm not saying to only utilize your language sample analysis to identify what to target. My other thing, and I kind of hinted on this earlier, is I really want to emphasize that there needs to be a focus on functionality. Um, historically, um, and I know how I was trained initially, uh, you know, we talked about writing goals like MLU and whatnot, and that is not necessarily a functional goal. It's not a goal that translates well to the classroom, and it definitely doesn't help inform families and teachers what it is that we're working on and students who are ultimately going to need to understand a their disorder and also what it is that they're working on and why that's important so um, in fo focusing on functionality um, a component of that is also making sure that we're um, doing it within a context that the behavior actually occurs in real life so the first sample that we're going to look at is Mike. Um, and so I would strongly encourage you to pause for a couple of minutes, find the language sample for Mike and all of the analysis. And I want you to kind of dig in and look at it. And then together, we're all going to look at that. And I'm going to go through the sheets. But before I get started on that, um, please pause the video. So what I would like you to do is pause the video and go ahead and look at Mike's sample. And uh, I would strongly recommend uh, always reading through the actual transcript first and then looking at the analysis so that you can uh, make some of your initial opinions first about how the sample aligns with what you would expect for a student that age. So in general, when I'm looking at Mike's sample, these are the areas, and I'm gonna pull up his transcript in a minute and we can look at it, but in general, what I observed was that there were concerns with his intelligibility. Um, you know, when we look at that, uh, the question always becomes with these students, is it intelligibility because of articulation? or is it intelligibility because they're having word finding organization types of problems where they kind of drown off and become quiet or they start to say things that just don't make sense. Um, and so we have words that are um, observed to be unintelligible. So this, again, the particular measure that I'm gonna show you uh, illustrates that intelligibility is a concern for Mike, but the cause underneath that rating could be one of those issues and they would require very different treatments, obviously. Um, another issue is his organization. 
Um, he has a very weak NSS score, so his narrative scoring scheme was rated quite low for his age, and he had a large number of mazed words, which again indicates that we're having word finding or organization types of issues when we go to do these more complex tasks, like retelling a story. Lastly, I saw indications that his syntax is weak. Um, this was uh, evidenced by his low MLU, both in words and morphemes. And I tend to see that those two parallel each other very closely. Um, so that's something to just kind of keep in mind when we get to goal writing and we think about writing goals that are going to make sense um, to the whole team and not just to us, the speech language pathologist. Um, another thing that's indicative of his poor syntax was that he had a large percentage of utterances with errors. So when we go to look at this within his sample, and I'm going to find Mike's um, sample, uh, again, I always encourage my students um, and I encourage you uh, to first spend your time really just reading through the transcript and getting some some observations that you're just seeing in relation to his ability to retell this story. And what you notice is that we've got verb tense agreement issues with regular past tense ED. He's leaving out prepositions. Um, you can see that we have these unintelligible words um, and phrases that are indicative of someone who's having difficulty. Again, here is another verb tense agreement issue in that particular sentence. Um, he uses the wrong word. Again, a word finding organizational type of a problem. Um, and you can see that he's using the same sentence starter with and, and this is not something that we would expect out of a typical five-year-old. So again, when you look at his story and we look at um, some of these issues, just our general first instinct would say that I want to see where those measures with verb tense agreement are falling. Um, how's his organization? What's his story structure look like? Um, and so now I'm going to go into my actual analyses um, that we had talked about here. So the first thing, just to kind of remind you, we have our standard measures report with Mike. Um, this line tells you how many different samples he got compared to. So there were 73 samples that were within six months of his age, older and younger. Um, and then we can just go through some of these. So again, as we noted before, anything that's more than one standard deviation is going to be highlighted in this darker gray color. Um, obviously, with uh, West Virginia um, instructions, you're going to especially look for those areas that are one and a half standard deviations or more below the mean. Um, I would caution you with some of these um, measures, it's actually worse to be above the mean, and I'll point those out here in a minute. But when we look at his percent intelligible utterances and words, you can see that we've got intelligibility issues. And so again, um, the question becomes, is this an articulation issue? Is this a word finding issue? You can see that his macro structure, his organization of his stories is significantly lower. It's more than two standard deviations. And that's, um, you know, a large variance from his peers. When we talk about anything that's one and a half to two standard deviations, this is a child that's going to really have difficulty being successful in the classroom. Um, even his MLU and morphemes, because he's leaving off all those grammatical morphemes, this is a case where his MLU and morphemes is significantly worse than his MLU and words, but both of these, um, you know, are less than what we would expect for a five-year-old. And then we can look at his pauses between utterances, um, his percent amazed words. These are all measures that are indicative of someone who's having organization or possibly word finding issues. So again, we look at the patterns of those errors. We look at what they sound like, what they look like um, to get an idea. And then 
I mean, here we have his percentage of utterances with errors. He's almost eight standard deviations below the mean. This is one, or above the mean. This is one of those measures that I was talking about. It's actually worse to be above the mean because what I'm saying is you have more, more utterances with errors than your peers. Um, obviously, we could flip-flop that, but in this particular case, SALT looks at this as the percentage of utterances with errors. We would typically expect that to be about 15%. He's looking at almost 72%. So think of that. That's almost three out of four of his utterance have some kind of mistake in them. And so that's a significant problem because that can really create issues with your conversational partner understanding what you're trying to say when you have the, that many errors um, in your sample, whether they be verb tense agreement, word finding issues, using the wrong word, um, keeping things organized. Um, some of those times he's omitting. So he had 18 omissions, which is 17 more than you would expect or 16 more than you would expect for a child his age. Um, and then uh, he had 18 error codes within the sample. Normally we would expect four based on that mean. So again, all of those initial in, um, impressions that we had when we looked at his sample are starting to play out in the numbers. And this can really help you to get that cohesive look that may or may not have been able to be demonstrated in your standardized test, but it definitely creates a much better picture that aligns with the classroom experience that he's having as opposed to those standardized tests where we're just finishing single words or you know creating sentences to match pictures which is not something that students are typically asked to do um, when we look at his use of conjunctions he had 13 we would normally expect about 32, almost 33. Um, and if you really think about it, most of his conjunctions were and, so we're not seeing a lot of variety there. Um, he has um, uh, issues with using regular past tense ED correctly. And again, we noticed that in our initial observations. Um, so again, you can see this particular area looks at how flexible his sentence length is. Um, so this area down here shows what you would typically see in students his age. And you can see that on average, a lot of students will have these sporadic long utterances. And really, this particular student, Mike, is not using anything more than 10 words long. And that shows how limited he is in being able to be descriptive or in depth with his um, stories when he goes to do that type of a task. Um, when we look at his maze summary, we knew that he had organization issues. His percentage of total words that were mazed was significantly higher than his peers. Um, his percentage of utterances that were maze, had a maze in them was significantly higher. Again, these are just indicative of someone who's having difficulty getting their thoughts um, put together in a way that will um, be efficient and effective. And then in this last piece, you'll notice um, again that we had talked about his narrative scoring scheme and how he was significantly poorer than his peers in his ability to organize his thoughts and put together um, all of this. And so this kind of gives you those areas um, that he was rated lower. And you can see that depending on the area, you know, obviously his introduction was very weak. Um, his conflict resolution was weak. His ability to be cohesive and create co cohesive ties between things and statements in his story was much weaker than his peers. So these are just instances where his data is really giving us actual percentages of where he has weaknesses so that then we can use this information either as the baseline data for our goal or for helping us identify a curriculum, a goal that's relevant to the curriculum, um, because narratives, as you're gonna see later in our discussion, are very much integrated into the curriculum. And we th think about 
um, our obligation to provide academically relevant intervention and target academically relevant behaviors. This is a particular student that would really benefit from some narrative treatment and using narrative as the context of treatment once we get the entire macrostructure solidified with him. So that's kind of our picture with Mike when we look at his sample. And um, again, one of the things that I really want you to think about is if we just look at the behaviors that we measured um, and only treated those behaviors, we wouldn't get to the underlying root of his issues. Um, you know, if we only focused on macrostructure and then separated that out from the mazed words, what we really see is those two things are tied together. It's an organizational problem and possibly the reason behind his intelligibility issues. So really, we really want to look for these places where our students' behaviors are tied together and target those underlying issues so that we can be as efficient as possible in treating their disorders um, so that we if we get too tied to a specific disorder like i just want to par target regular past tense ed i'm really going to miss an opportunity to hit his global issues with verb tense agreement and treat all of those at once again following those linguistic principles that we've been talking about um, writing our goals in a linguistically appropriate way so that we can treat multiple things at once we can create extension beyond our actual treatment and into other things um, as much as possible, we want to be efficient therapists and make sure that we're treating these underlying principles and not just the specific behavior that's being observed. So now we have Annie, who's our next sample. Um, again, I'm going to encourage you to pause this particular um, video because I want you to look at the samples first. Again, read the transcript first then go in and read the summary that SALT gives you, read the analyses um, yourself, think about where you see patterns and overlays, um, because it's in those patterns and overlays that you're really going to find um, the core issues that you can treat so that you can be really efficient with your treatment. So again, amongst, you know, if you're in a group or if you had a chance to jot down your notes and, and kind of looked at what you saw with Annie, um, I kind of take a minute and look at those again. I know I keep saying that, but I really want you to practice kind of um, making some observations and then trying to find some of those core elements that are happening as we look at some of these. Um, in particular, when we look at Annie, um, and we see her, she's eight years old, so she's in about third grade is what I would expect, um, unless she's been held back. Uh, and you can see that she's been asked to retell the Pukins Gets Her Way story. Um, and now we're going to kind of read through her transcript. And if we look at her utterances, um, you can see that she starts out um, and she says her way. Um, she always gets her way, doesn't she, says the um, examiner. Um, she makes faces. She throws apples. She screams as loud as she can. So you can see we had no introduction to our story. Um, we're really just describing the actions that are in the picture. She ate ice cream for breakfast. She's giving her cat looks like her dinner. She can't pick up her clothes, and she got all the toys that she wanted. She was skating in the living room. Again, um, this doesn't sound so much like a story, as, but more like a description of the activities that are happening um, in that particular book and describing the actions of the pictures. Um, really what you would expect a four-year-old to do when we think about the development of narratives and where they're at. Um, definitely by eight, she should be able to have some kind of initiating event that's driving the story, some actions to resolve um, that initiating event and we definitely had nothing up here that even introduced the character um, we had jumped right in and called her she we had no reference 
um, to Pukin. Uh, and then um, we get down here and she introduces the gnome. Uh, she said, I want three wishes for the first wish. And this is where she kind of starts to do somewhat of a story, but really she's still just kind of describing the pictures to the best of her ability. And so um, I don't see a lot of verb tense agreement issues. I don't feel, see a lot of verb issues. You know, there's a few things here and there, but that's really not her biggest problem when I think about um, her being successful in the classroom, I just don't see her picking up on the clues as to what's important in this story and really being able to retell it in a way that is effective. Um, and so in that regard, um, those are the things that I'm getting concerned with with her. Um, sorry, I forgot to go back and look at her numbers. So then we look at her standard measures report. Again, we've got 73 samples that are um, six months above and below her current age. Uh, in general, we don't see as much up in this area that is as concerning. Even this is only about one standard deviation below the mean. So, you know, within our West Virginia guidelines, that would be um, within the range that we would consider acceptable. Um, but we get down here to sentence length and you can see that she's not being as descriptive as you would expect for her age. Um, I would suspect, although it wasn't analyzed, that she's not using a lot of dependent clauses since she has shorter sentences um, by more than two standard deviations than what we would expect. Um, you can see that her total number of words is about appropriate. Um, but again, the sentence, average sentence length is a lot shorter than what we would expect. Um, not necessarily a huge issue with her mazed words. So you can see this is different than what we had as far as a profile with Mike. Um, and then even her NSS, although I'm not sure that the narrative scoring scheme really picked up on her issues um, with her narrative, because again, my instinct tells me that her story really reads more like an action sequence and not so much like a complete episode. And so I do have concerns with her story structure and how that was put together. We go down and we look at her word list and bound morphemes. And again, this is not something that is much of a concern with her. Um, verb tense agreement grammar was not an issue that we really saw, but what we saw was sentence complexity, description, um, really tying the pieces of the story. Um, and when we go in to talk about narrative intervention, creating those cohesive ties and the connections between the different story grammar elements is definitely something that isn't driving in hers. And again, this would be another measure that would really illustrate where you don't see her being as flexible in the length of her utterances. Um, because you can see that these longer utterances just aren't happening with her as compared to her typical peers. Um, so then when we look at this narrative scoring scheme, remember I said she jumped right in and didn't really introduce the characters at the beginning of the story. And we did have some cohesive ties um, and those types of issues. But her overall scheme, at least the way they scored, seem to be appropriate, but um, there are some other measures that might pick up on that issue with her lack of a complete episode and really having an age appropriate story retell. So that's kind of Annie's picture from my perspective. Um, we'll come back and think about, you know, what would be some target goals, some target behaviors with her, how we would tie those into the college and career readiness standards here in a little bit. So our next student that we're going to look at is Donald. And Donald actually completed two samples. So you're going to see um, he's five years old. So he's in kindergarten, much like Mike. Um, and he completed a conversational sample as well as a narrative retell. So you're going to have two samples that I would like you to read through and then look at those analyses. Um, and then we're going to talk about what they tell us and what they show us um, after you've paused the video now.
So again, um, if you're with peers or a group, um, you may have either worked together or separately, but definitely share your thoughts and see where you guys have agreement, where do you have differences. Um, it's wonderful to have people see and observe different things because I think it makes us grow as speech language pathologists so that we don't become um, quite as myopic as we sometimes do. But um, again, going back to Mike's or Donald's sample, um, we'll start with his conversational sample, uh, which was the first sample that you had. And I'm not going to look at it in particular, but you'll notice in this standard measures report, um, he really doesn't have numbers that look too bad other than in these intelligibility issues. And again, reiterating what I said with Mike before, um, intelligibility is a difficult issue to identify because we never know if that's an articulation piece just looking at the numbers or if that's really a word finding problem. So again, without listening to the sample, just looking at these um, standard measure reports, you're not going to be able to get the full uh, understanding of what's happening with that particular percentage. When we go um, on down, uh, what we do see is that even in the conversational sample, Donald is really struggling with his verb tense agreement and grammar in general um, because he's already almost three standard deviations. So my guess would be that when we get to the narratives, which are going to be a more complex task, they're going to be more difficult for him to do that what we should um, predict based on other students with language disorders is that he would have even more difficulty um, with his grammar in those particular situations. So again, I'm going to kind of, for the essence of time, go ahead and skip down to his narrative and see what kinds of patterns that we see here. But what I want you to really pay attention to, if nothing else, look at how much more of this sample is gray in this particular column, indicating that he's um, significantly different from his peers as compared to when we did the conversational sample. Um, I like it when I get these real uh, opportunities to demonstrate that complexity of the task that we ask students to do can really impact what we see. Um, and here is concrete evidence that if we had only gone off of his conversational sample, we wouldn't have a full picture of the difficulties that Donald is going to have in the classroom. Um, we see that he's almost one and a half standard deviations on the length of his sample in having complete and intelligible utterances. Um, again, his intelligibility continues to be an issue even in the narrative. Um, so that is something that's consistent. And I love consistency because that tells us that it's definitely something that would benefit from some work. Um, we also see that his story grammar is significantly poorer than his peers. Um, he's one and a half standard deviations below his peers in being able to retell a story. Uh, he's almost two standard deviations below in sentence length. And this was not a measure that was significant in the previous sample. So you can see how I increased the complexity of the task. And now his ability to have longer sentences um, has been impacted as well. Um, and that obviously will go into effect with his total number of words. Um, you can see that he uh, isn't using as many words per minute, indicating that he may be having some organization um, word finding types of problems. And again, as I had predicted, we have this higher percentage of utterances with errors as compared to the conversational sample. So while he was struggling in conversation, now he's really showing evidence of a poor syntactic system um, when we go to retell a story. And so that's a definitely something that's a concern because uh, we do a lot more narratives and narrative type tasks in school than we do conversation. 
Um, so when we look at having an impact on his academic performance and being able to target something that will result in better performance in the classroom, this is definitely something that we should consider targeting so that we get that um, intervention to class carryover. Again, as we go through some of these things, we can start to see where there are additional issues. He's got some personal pronoun problems. Um, again, verb tense agreement issues appear to be arising. Um, he's got issues, again, with word finding um, and those types of things. We talked about his macro structure, um, story grammar structure really um, being weak. And in particular, you know, he's not doing the job that we would expect with identifying the um, issues and having uh, solutions to fixing those issues and having cohesive ties. Um, a lot of that could be tied to those pronoun problems that we noticed earlier. Um, and then we can see those verb tense agreement issues coming out again um, in his use of third person singular S, although there was only one instance. Um, but that's interesting in and of itself because you wouldn't expect a present tense in a story retell. So that tells us that he's flip-flopping his um, tense um, in a story, which is indicative of a student with a language disorder as well. Um, this is always a nice analysis as well because it gives us a breakdown of those um, utterances that had error codes so that you can start to look at the patterns. We've got some article issues. We've got some copula issues with both of these, and then we've got some verb tense agreement issues. So those copula issues fall in line with these verb tense agreement issues. So a cohesive goal um, targeting verb tense agreement would actually work on both of those areas simultaneously and be helpful. Um, so again, this goes back to that ability to target the real underlying issue of verb tense agreement and not get caught up in copulas and auxiliaries only or regular past tense ED. What we really want to focus in on um, with him is that verb tense agreement issue that he seems to be struggling with. Um, so that kind of takes us through Donald um, and what he's looking at. And then our last sample is Steve. And Steve is a little bit different from our previous three samples in that he is 12. So you're looking at about a sixth grader, um, depending on where in the year we are. And he has completed an expository task. So he did the favorite game or sport task. Um, and then we can look at how he does with that particular task. So... Um, Again, pause your video and then we'll look at what we see with Steve um, in his language sample. So when we go to look at Steve and we look at his sample, the first thing I want you to think about is how short it was. Um, for a child that is as old as Steve doing this task, you would normally expect a transcript of two or three pages. Um, and so that in and of itself, the fact that we're really at one page tells you that he's not giving us enough information. Then when we go to look at his actual utterances, you know, there's not a lot of organization happening. You see, we've got these abandoned utterances. Um, that are happening a lot, which tell us that he's having a hard time thinking about what he wants to say, how he wants to say it. We've got some intelligibility problems going on here. Lots of amazing. So my first instinct is this is a kid that, that needs some more therapy to really work on the organization of these different text structures um, because he's not able to figure out what good text structure should look like. Um, which means he's going to have comprehension issues, he's going to have writing issues, he's going to have note-taking issues. Um, when we think about the academic curriculum, being able to organize information as it comes in, whether that's orally and writing, um, is really important. And then in reality, 
uh, students who are, are typical students pick up on the fact that then when I'm supposed to produce these same type of texts, I should follow that same structure. Um, whereas your kids with language disorders don't pick up on that and they have to be taught to use that structure. So this is a student that I really think would benefit from that first and foremost, um, really teaching structure. Um, again, this isn't about the content. Um, so I know a lot of times um, speech and language pathologists will start to think that they're turning into more of a tutor. Um, and if you feel like you're turning into a tutor, it's because you're focusing on content and not underlying principles. So you just have to kind of grab yourself when you start to sink into that and make sure that you're really focusing on or on these underlying principles like organization um, and not whether or not they understand the Civil War. Um, because I, you know, not that I don't care about the Civil War, but what I really want them to understand is the structure of how the information about the Civil War is being presented so that they can figure out how to organize that information in their notes, in their mind, and then write a paper about it. Um, so then uh, we go back up here and we look at Steve's standard measures report and you can see how this expository task really exposed his weak language system because we have so much gray over there in that one column. Um, and so then again, I always just kind of quickly start gliding through looking to see if I've got anything over one and a half standard deviations and his length of sample um, is not completely off the mark. He's almost one and a half standard deviations below the mean in that case. Definitely having these intelligibility issues Again, this tends to be more indicative of organization, but it's possible it's Arctic, so I need to pay attention to that. Um, again, his organization is almost three standard deviations below the mean with his score for the expository scoring scheme, so he's really not able to put this together in a cohesive way. And his MLU, um, so his sentences are significantly shorter than his peers. Um, a lot less vocabulary than what we would expect, both in variety as well as total number of words. Um, and then he's abandoning his utterances significantly more often than other sixth graders. Um, and so these are all things that, um, you know, I look at these measures and at least three of them are all tied to organization problems. Uh, and, and not really just a specific thing. So doing therapy to treat his understanding of how to put his thoughts in to an organized way with expository text should improve both his abandoned utterances. It should improve his expository um, scoring scheme scores, um, possibly his intelligibility issues. And then we would also hopefully get longer utter a sample um, because he would have more to say. And then once that is solidified, then we could start working on um, number of different words and total number of words and sentence length to get that more complex. So again, um, when we go to look at his information, you can see that, you know, he's not using as many negatives. His conjunctions um, are significantly less than his peers. Again, that's not surprising considering his number of different words measure that was up there um, was less than his peers. Um, and then when we get to his rate, um, his average pause time, that would be indicative of a student who's having trouble thinking of what they need to say next is significantly longer than his peers. Um, here's that narrative scoring scheme. Um, he didn't even give us really the object and you would expect him to really be able to give a pretty good object of the task that he was doing. Um, lacks information in these areas related to the preparation or how to start play. So again, these this narrative scoring scheme um, is indicative of a student who really doesn't know how to use his graphic organizer that he was provided. Um, and then can't expand upon that to give a pretty good sample. So that kind of summarizes what we see with Steve when we go to look at his sample. 
Um, so now it comes to the question of what are we going to target in our goals? Uh, and just quickly to kind of reiterate, when we talk about goals, they need to be readable. And I can't emphasize this em enough. Um, we need to make sure that we're writing goals that teachers understand. Um, and we're writing goals that are obviously tied to the curriculum. Um, a lot of times we will write what I call speechy goals. Um, and I'm guilty of doing that too. I would write copulent auxiliary goals. Um, teachers don't understand copulent auxiliary goals, but they understand grammatical sentences. Um, so having things written that says that Johnny's going to have 80% um, of his um, sentences grammatical, I know that I need to target verb tense agreement, but now that also makes sense to the teacher, the student, the family. Um, and so we need to step back and make sure that we're writing goals that are readable. That, that means they can't have these long phrases that are so hard to understand what in the world you're doing to take data. Um, we can create tasks that aren't so complex. Um, if you can't hand your goal to somebody and, and they can't implement it, um, then it's not readable. And that doesn't mean just another SLP. That means a teacher, it means a parent. Um, so we need to be um, kind of giving ourselves uh, an evaluation of the readability of our goals because I think sometimes um, in our effort to meet all of the legal uh, requirements, we actually end up creating a lot of barriers for our families and our students. They obviously need to be that famous SMART goal um, and really the important piece of that is measurability and being relevant. Um, so make sure that you have good measurable goals, um, that the way that they're being measured makes sense, um, and that they're related to the curriculum in an obvious way, not something where only another SLP would be able to figure out how that's important. So going back to Mike, um, this is kind of the, the pattern, the, the hierarchy of questions that I would recommend you ask for every student that you have. What are their major patterns of errors? Um, so again, going back to Mike, when we looked at Mike, um, we had issues with intelligibility slash organization. Um, so where do those come out in the college and career readiness standards? And then what behaviors could we target that would improve his ability to be successful in the classroom related to those? So um, again, those college and career readiness standards, I cannot emphasize enough. Um, I really think that these are things that for every student you have as you're going through their IEP, um, you have an obligation to open up the grade level or the grade below college and career readiness standards to see um, either what they should have been able to do already or what would be the goal for their normal peer at the end of that grade. So these standards are written that at the end of kindergarten, they would be able to ask and answer questions about key details. Um, Mike has not got a structure based on his performance on that narrative task that's going to permit him to be able to do this particular task at the end of kindergarten. So it makes sense for us to really target narratives so that we can start to address that. We don't need to wait for the gap to come. Go ahead and treat it. You know it's coming. You know he's gonna be expected to do this. Um, in reality, um, narrative treatment can start in preschool. So there's no reason not to start it with a kindergarten. Um, he should be able to retell familiar stories with prompts and supports. Well, when he was doing his frog retell, he had the book in front of him. He had listened to the story and he still performed lower significantly than his peers. So this is clearly not a, a standard that he's going to meet at the end of this year without some significant intervention to help him. Um, these kids that are already below are not going to make enough gains in the classroom to meet these standards. Um, and so we need to start sooner rather than later um, in addressing these issues um, that make sure that they can identify characters. If they can retell a story with this information, then they can usually answer questions about it because it's in listening identifying the important information, organizing it, and then being able to express your thoughts and ideas to retell the story 
that is a much more complex than just at answering questions. Um, so again, when we look at these standards and we think about, you know, can he even draw a picture um, to begin to tell a story and be able to do all of that? Um, these would be indicative, you know, drawing is a precursor to writing. So can they draw a sequence of pictures and then tell you a story about them? Um, I doubt Mike would be able to do that. And then when we look at his use of grammar, that's going to fall in this ELA um, kindergarten point three six, um, using grammatical sentences, um, being able to expand on his ideas um, using all of that. And so um, then we can look at his vocabulary. Um, is he starting to use all of this? Um, using different inflections and affixes, you know, prefixes and suffix suffixes um, and those types of things. So if you look at these standards, um, the beauty of it is they are all related. So when you get to um, the standard ELA K.1 related to reading, it's going to turn into 3.1 in third grade and so on and so forth. So um, they build nicely. It makes things really easy to follow along as you're going so that you can really relate these back to those issues that we're having um, related to uh, his ability to work with narratives and understand them. And we know that students' ability to retell and answer questions about story is highly correlated with their fourth grade reading comprehension scores. So the more we do in kindergarten to help address this area, the better off our outcomes would be when we get into fourth grade. So now when we think about this related to Annie, um, remember she was still kind of sitting here at this action sequence, not really introducing her characters, and then she had really short sentences. So again, going in and identifying those major patterns so that we can target those, um, relating them to the college and career readiness standards, and thinking about those as we write the goal. Um, where I've practiced in the past, we would literally write the goal and then write the standard that that goal um, either directly relates to or that what that goal lays a foundation for related to that standard. So we would literally be writing ELA K.3, K.1 um, or ELA reading um, 3.2 or whatever it was that the standard was that was related to what we were targeting. Um, and it's my understanding that that is laying on the horizon. So getting used to going in with your students as you're doing your annual evaluations, your reevaluations to qualify, and seeing where you're getting these mismatches on their abilities in relation to these college and career readiness standards will help you to become more accustomed because I think what you're going to find is, um, for instance, as we get to Donald, um, his profile is different, yet still the same. He's still struggling um, to have the skills needed to meet the same standards that Mike needed to meet, but his profile is a little bit different um, than even Mike. Um, and so with him, you know, we're seeing even more issues with grammaticality and, and vocabulary, um, whereas total number of words wasn't an issue so much with Mike, with the narrative retell, it was with him, um, but both of them are having organization issues. So the thing that I want to point out is it seems overwhelming at the beginning, because how are you going to get familiar with all of these standards? Well, in reality, um, your kids with developmental language disorders are going to struggle with the same underlying issues to a large extent. And once you know which standards those issues align with, it becomes pretty easy to identify those and integrate them into your IEP. So it's really just a matter of getting started starting to put those spreadsheets or those lists together so that you have your quick references that you can go to that you're thinking about changes how you talk to teachers 
teachers that have a lot more interest in what you're doing when you're talking about the college and career readiness standards. Um, because to be completely honest, they couldn't care less about MLU. They couldn't care less about the narrative scoring scheme. They couldn't care less about all of those things. But if you talk about you know, being able to an answer questions or do a retell that in includes the character, the setting, and the initiating, they're automatically plugged in because they know those things and they know how they relate to the curriculum. So it's a matter of us adapting into their world rather than expecting them to come into our world, which in all reality is not the world that the student's going to exist in. They don't get evaluated and deemed successful based on our measures. They get evaluated and deemed successful based on the college and career readiness standards. So related to that, we've got Steve. Um, again, expository text was a perfect thing to look at with him. He's in sixth grade. That is probably where he spends 70 to 90% of his day because even when you think about English language arts, he's supposed to be comparing different pieces of literature, which is a compare contrast um, activity or describing how um, an author's life or experiences impacted their writings. That's kind of descriptive and interactive. So these are tasks that are very complex. And if he can't even organize his thoughts to tell about his favorite sport, how in the world is he going to be able to do these tasks in science and social studies and, and English language arts? So again, figuring out those patterns first figuring out where they relate to the college and career readiness standards, and then targeting those underlying behaviors so that we can write goals that are relevant to him. Um, it's so important that we teach our students with developmental language disorders about their disability. It's not going to go away, and they've got to understand their strengths and weaknesses so that they can advocate for themselves, and we need to create independent um, students who can become independent adults who know what they need to be successful so that they can get into environments where they can be successful. It's absolutely critical that um, we not only treat these behaviors, but we um, create self-functioning adults who can advocate for themselves as they become um, older and expected to do so. So things to consider um, as we go forward. Uh, first, um, I think self-evaluation is a really important piece of practice. And so make sure that you don't get stuck. You're not always targeting the same college and career readiness standard. You're not always targeting the same behavior. Make sure that you're making these decisions based on your student. Um, an easy way to do this in a tool that ASHA has available to you is this PACE tool. Um, and so it's a beautiful tool um, that you can use to help become more successful. Um, and I will send you the link to it so that you can get to it and, and evaluate it. Um, but that PACE tool is really important when we think about um, developing our own uh, professional development plans. Um, you create surveys um, that you complete where you evaluate your caseload, you evaluate your current strengths and needs according to knowledge and skills, um, you get feedback from the teachers you work with, you get feedback from the parents that are willing to participate, um, you ask your students to help evaluate, and then you try and figure out where you want to work on and, and develop a year-long plan on how you're going to become a better speech language pathologist. I think this is an amazing um, piece that ASHA provides that could really help you to develop very strategic um, plans for improving your practice as a professional. So I'd encourage you to take advantage of using that particular tool um, because I think it's quite valuable. Um, and then lastly, I want to encourage you again, I know we focused on the language sampling data for this particular piece, but use all of your assessment data when you go to write goals, um, your intervention, your observation, and your treatment information or your testing information. Um, not just the language samples, but also your standardized tests, 
Um, I think classroom observations are absolutely critical. Um, I think they give us a whole new view on how our students look compared to their peers. So I can't emphasize that piece enough. Um, and then really working with the whole team to develop your goals. So hopefully um, you understand the conventions of the language sample transcription. Um, you feel more comfortable looking at the data that we're going to be providing you in the from the database um, and then can identify some of those common analyses related to academic language and then kind of see where that can be incorporated in relationship to the college and career readiness standards. And so again, as usual, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me and we will work together to answer your questions and try and help make all of this more relevant. Go and find all of that information.